Before we start this episode, we wanted to give another massive thank you to Magellan TV who are kindly sponsoring us today. As a lot of you will already know, we've been using Magellan TV for ages now and we personally find it to be the best place to get our documentary fix. There's every category you can think of and with more content being uploaded every week, it's pretty impossible to run out. Their true crime category is of course our favourite and one documentary we wanted to recommend to all of you is How to Catch a Killer. These are the inside stories behind New Zealand's most shocking crimes and the hunt for those responsible. It's got a real forensic files feel to it. It's packed full of archive footage, breakdowns of how they examine various types of crime scenes, and interviews with the people at the heart of solving these crimes. It's a real detailed deep dive and we know you're going to love it. If you want to check out this amazing documentary as well as so many more, Magellan TV have offered you all a one month free trial, which you can get to by clicking on the link in our description box. That's try.magellantv.com forward slash truly criminal. And then you can watch How to Catch a Killer 2 and come back and let us know what you all thought. Thank you again to Magellan TV for your continued support of our channel and this fantastic offer for our viewers. Nineteen-year-old Maple Patalia was born near Mumbai in India before moving to Surrey in British Columbia with her family shortly after. Friends said she was warm and intelligent, ambitious and determined, a straight-A student with dreams of being a doctor. She was also very creative and was starting to make waves in the entertainment industry. As well as studying health and science, she was often picking up modelling and acting gigs. She landed a role in the 2010 movie Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and filmed an episode of The Secret Circle, which was airing on The CW. She was already signed to a modelling agency and was over the moon when she found out she was a finalist in the Central City Model Search. The head of her agency said she was super intelligent, very articulate, very focused, and probably one of the most likeable individuals you could ever meet. She had gained a place at Simon Fraser University and lived at home with her family and commuted. She hoped to go to medical school after she finished, but she also told friends she was enjoying riding the acting wave so much she didn't want to rule this out as a long-term career. Safe to say for someone so young, she was busy, but embracing all the challenges and opportunities that were coming her way, and balancing them all well. Mabel had been in a four-year off-and-on relationship with 20-year-old Gajinda Daliwal, known to everyone as Gary, but their relationship finally came to an end in 2011, when Maple found out he had cheated on her. She was heartbroken about the betrayal, but she had enough to keep her busy, throwing herself into her work and her all-important studies. On the evening of September 27th, 2011, Maple left her family home and headed to the campus library with a friend. They had a late-night study session planned and met up with a few more people there as well, as the hours ticked by into the next morning, they all decided to call it a day. Maple hugged her friends goodbye and headed to her car, which was on the third floor of the parking lot. Just minutes after 1am, a resident across the street suddenly heard seven loud bangs in quick succession. He ran to his window to see a white Dodge Charger screeching away. More people came running out onto the street calling 911 as they did. Maple was lying on the ground near her car, surrounded by blood. She had been shot five times, three of which hit her in the stomach, and her head was covered in stab wounds and cut marks. A large bloody kitchen knife was lying nearby. She was still alive, but only just. Authorities, who had received dozens of calls about the gunshots already, were on scene within minutes. They worked on Maple long enough to make sure she was stable, and she was finally rushed to the local hospital. But her injuries were proved too severe, and she died just a few hours later. Shots fired here at this the area. Uh, 
on the third floor of this parkade. Uniformed officers attended, and they did locate uh, an adult female, 19 years of age, located uh, here behind me, suffering from uh, what can only be described as significant and multiple gunshot wounds. Those two uni uniformed officers did everything they could in an effort to save this uh, young lady's life while they waited for AHS to, tend, to attend. We understand the sensitivity here in regards to what the community is feeling and where this occurred, how it may have occurred, and whether there's a link uh, specifically uh, to the SFU campus here. I can confirm that yes, there is a link to the SFU campus in that this 19-year-old girl was a active student here at this campus. It was such a frenzied attack, made even more shocking as it happened in such an open, public, and despite the time of day, still fairly busy place. It was obvious from the cameras around the campus that many students were doing exactly the same thing as Maple that night. But despite how many people were around, there wasn't a single witness on the third floor of the parking complex. Fear swept through the university campus and the following day, 50 officers were working on the case. Investigators were keeping their cards close to their chest, although they didn't have as many as they would have liked. They said they didn't know if the attack was random or targeted. Maple's wallet had been found next to her and nothing had been taken, which seemed to rule a robbery out. They also said it seemed unlikely that the shooting was linked to gang violence, but they couldn't say anything with absolute certainty. They tried to reassure the students that they were still safe on campus, with one detective saying, other than the fact this homicide appears to have occurred adjacent to the Simon Fraser campus, we don't feel that the student body and leadership of the Simon Fraser University campus needs to be unduly alarmed. Dozens of RCMP officers are investigating yesterday's shocking shooting of a 19-year-old SFU student. Well, Tony, 40 to 50 officers are now on the case here at SFU, a case that some say is hitting investigators very hard. Many of them have daughters, and that's motivating them to find the killer. Grief is the focus at Maple Battaglia's family home today, although no doubt there are many questions. Why would someone shoot the young woman several times as she made her way to her car after a late night of studying? Who would be capable of killing such a beautiful young 19-year-old girl in the prime of her life? Did uh, this 19-year-old young woman know her attacker? Um, or was there somebody involved um, in regards to this that she knew that assisted in this homicide. We don't have those answers. Students are more careful since the killing, sticking closer together. So we kind of walk together in a group, but ever since this incident, we felt like it, there's more, we are more inclined to do so now. With his eyes filled with tears, the university spokesperson said they were making counselling available for anyone who felt they needed it, and for as long as they did so. Vigils were held and the community grieved together. It makes you angry in a way that she was just footsteps away from her car. It was just right there and it just, it just makes you like, it's like a big shock. The integrated homicide investigation team continues to investigate tips in this murder case, but so far no one has been arrested. Officers know there are still people out there in the community who have vital information and they're pleading with them to come forward. Just help us get our justice that we deserve. And she, no daughter, no sister, deserves to go through what my sister went through. She was innocent. And for you to stay quiet, it's not the right thing. Maple's family said they could only think of one person that would have any reason to harm her. Her ex-boyfriend, 20-year-old Gary. But to go as far as to kill her, it was a lot for them to contemplate. Being on and off since high school, the young couple had had their fair share of issues. But after their relationship came to its final end in the fall of 2011, Gary's behaviour took an especially dark turn. Her family told police that a scary pattern of stalking and harassment had started. 
Between mid-August and late September of 2011, Gary made more than 2,000 calls to Maple and texted her even more than that. On one night when she was out at a club with a friend, he sent a total of 300 text messages. He started following her and having his friends follow her, keeping tabs on where she was and who she was with. He spat on one of Maple's friends outside a club and punched another one of her friends after he found out he and Maple were having coffee. After Maple tried to intervene, he pushed her to the floor. She called the police. He was arrested and ordered not to have any contact with her and was charged with assault. The friend he had punched was one of the friends that had been with Maple in the library that night. But with no witnesses and currently no evidence to suggest he was on campus that night, police had little to go on, but they did have one crucial piece of evidence. The resident that looked out of his window had got a perfect description of what they believed was the getaway car. He saw it speeding away at around 1.04am, and he could tell them what street he saw it on too. Although the number plate could not be made out, they were able to work backwards using the cameras, and fortunately, the university was well covered with almost 100 cameras, and they were pretty good quality too. They started releasing parts of the footage and asking those on the tapes to come forward with anything they had, no matter how small. Looking at the rest of the videos, detectives could easily spot Maple in the library with her friends, smiling and laughing as she worked. But it didn't seem that anyone was watching or following her, and Maple appeared comfortable with where she was and who she was with. Just before 1am, Maple and her three friends left the library together. Although there was no audio, everything still looked fine, and Maple seemed content walking with them. Staff at the university were able to identify everyone she was with that night, and they all voluntarily gave statements. Officers were happy to rule them all out as being involved. It seemed they had all parted ways, just minutes before she was shot. The camera on the third floor parking lot was on a timer, and set to pan around the whole area every couple of minutes. And, frustratingly, just as Maple entered the floor, the camera cut away from the entrance, and they could see nothing but they could see the same white car had entered the parking lot just after 8pm. It circled around for ages before parking up, and as it finally did, Maple and her friend entered the frame. It was obvious that whoever was in the car was aware that Maple would be there that evening and was tracking her every move. This was not someone who happened to be there at the same time and took the opportunity. This was a carefully and meticulously planned murder. We begin with an emotional vigil in Surrey tonight. More than 100 people held an event to remember Maple Battaglia. It's been a year since she was shot to death, but no one has been arrested. We know that in a year's time, people will talk. We believe that people have talked about this murder and that may have more information than uh, what they initially had in the beginning stages. And we want those people to come forward, the people that have the intimate knowledge about her homicide. We always love our angel. It never changed. <laughs> and for that person to be out there and be free and my sister will never come back, it's just not right. It was now 2012 and officers were still diligently working on Maple's case. They just didn't have enough to make any arrests. For months, the team took on the painstaking task of cross-referencing everyone that owned or had rented the same make and model of car in the area interviewing and slowly ruling people out. Finally, in late 2012, they made a connection. The name Gersamar Bedi was linked to one of the cars. He was a close friend of Gary's and a fellow student at the university. He had rented a white Dodge Charger on September the 25th, 2011 and returned it shortly after the 28th. When he picked the car up, he was with none other than Gary. 21-year-old Gersamar had also put the vehicle through a car wash within the hours after Maple was shot. Police managed to track down the car, and despite the cleaning, they found a shell casing under the hood that matched the shells found at the scene. On December 1st, 2012, over a year since Maple was killed, authorities announced that they had made not one, but two arrests. Columbia. 
Maple Battaglia was gunned down on a university campus in September 2011. And since then, she, uh, her family and friends have appealed to the public to help find her killers. Now, police have arrested her ex-boyfriend and another man. The CBC's Dan Burrett has that story. Maple Battaglia's father, Harry, vowed to wear black until he received justice for his daughter's murder. His family joined him in black and a little closer to justice now that two men have been charged in the death of their daughter and sister. This isn't an easy day for us. It's very bittersweet, but although we can't bring Maple back, we're happy to see that the people that are responsible for this are now going to suffer the consequences. I can tell you that I knew this day would come. I knew that to be true because uh, I know that every day uh, we commit to ensuring that justice and the rule of law prevails. Maple's ex-boyfriend Gary was charged with first-degree murder and his friend Gersimar was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and being an accessory after the fact. Gersimar had followed Maple's car for days before the murder, helped Gary flee the scene, put the vehicle through the car wash and gave him an alibi for months. The gun used in the murder was never found. Gary was furious that Maple was moving on without him, socialising and having many a success come her way. Her life did not include him anymore. And for someone who was already jealous, insecure and possessive, he felt if he couldn't have her, then no one could. Her family said he felt he could impose the relationship on her and take away the choice for her to want to leave, ultimately taking her life in the process. And she's very happy when she break up with him. It's hard, but she's, she said, I try my best, no more. Maple friend Kiran, she told me, Gary, kill me, like a boy. But she did. Then the same time I call Gary, mom, because she is my friend. Make a your dog kill my daughter. <laughs> That's why I have a message to people. If your son or daughter controlling someone, please help. It was nearly two and a half years ago when 19-year-old Maple Battaglia was fatally gunned down in Surrey. Her ex-boyfriend has now been ordered to stand trial. A preliminary both men appeared in court, still remaining quiet, and both pleading not guilty. They were to be tried together, and four long years would pass as the trial got pushed back and delayed time and time again. It's too much hard for us. A long wait is gone. More than four, uh, four and a half years now. A long. Every day we think, what will happen? What will happen? And before the trial was set to start in 2016, the now 26-year-old Gary would change his plea. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 21 years. The judge could choose a period between 10 and 25 years and the prosecutor said it's probably the highest sentence given to someone convicted of killing one person as opposed to many people. Rosie Battaglia leaves court with the sense of closure she sought for more than four years. Thank you to the community members, friends, family who have supported us endlessly, endlessly through this process. It's been a really long time and Maple can finally rest in peace knowing that she got some justice. And we just want this to be an example in the community that no matter what you do, it does catch up to you and justice must be served. And I'm just hoping that she's looking down and is, is content that she finally got that justice. There's finality for this family. It's over. There are no appeals. There is no possibility of a uh, new trial being ordered. It's over. It's done um, with respect to Mr. Dollywall, and that is to the benefit of the family. 27-year-old Gersamar Bedi was later found not guilty of second-degree murder, but he was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact. He was sentenced to 22 months in prison, but six months before his sentence is scheduled end. Dark tonight from the family of Maple Battaglia, one of the two men involved in her high-profile 2011 murder has been released from jail. As he was released early. Maple's sister said, that 18-month sentence was a slap in my family's face. He had the audacity to stay quiet, even when the sentencing happened. He smirked at our family. 
He smirked at the people there in a way to imply that I got away with this. It took five years to get any form of justice for Maple and her family, and the devastating aftermath caused by her death is still felt in the Surrey area today. A documentary about Maple was released in 2017, which went on to win several awards at major festivals. The director, Jasleen Kaur, wanted the film to serve as a memorial to her, but also as a way of shedding light on domestic violence. The Maple Battaglia Memorial Scholarship for the Arts was set up and provides one annual entrance to a South Asian Canadian female student beginning their journey in the world of art and design. Member for Surrey Wally. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last Saturday, March the 4th, uh, a candlelight vigil took place at Holland Park in Surrey Wally to honour victims of domestic violence. One of the very poignant stories recounted was that of Maple Battalion. Mabel was an extraordinary and vibrant young woman, an SFU student and also an aspiring actress and model. The Battaglia family has responded to the tragedy in a strong and resilient way. And to honour Mabel's legacy, the Battaglia family has established a bursary to support students in SFU's health science department. Her mother, Sarjeet, told me on Saturday that as a result of her work, the fund now exceeds $100,000 and a separate Maple Battalion Memorial Scholarship for the Arts was also established in partnership with Emily Carr, University of Art and Design. Even after her death, her legacy goes on. 19-year-old Maple was already achieving so much, and with her determination and drive, there is no doubt she would have gone on to do many more amazing things in whatever career path she chose. One of Maple's friends reiterated this and described her death as like stomping on a flower before it bloomed. Her dad called her his most precious jewel and said his life feels completely useless now. We're left with nothing, he said. We lost our angel and she's not going to come back. He said even though Maple was the baby of the family, she was always the glue that held everyone together. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in today's case, we have left links to further resources in the description box below. Thank you all for tuning in, and we hope you found this video interesting. If you would like to support our channel and help us to continue to make our content, we have a Patreon with many perks including exclusive episodes, behind the scenes, and ad-free early access.